Jocelyn Morlock was a Canadian composer and music educator based in Vancouver, BC. Jocelyn was born in Manitoba, where she completed a Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance at Brandon University. She received both her master's degree and her doctorate of musical arts degree from the University of British Columbia, where her composition teachers included Stephen Chapman, Keith Hamill, and the late Russian-Canadian composer Nikolai Korndorf. Her music, described with its shimmering sheets of harmonics and an approach that is deftly idiomatic, Morlock's music has received numerous national and international accolades, including Top 10 at the 2002 International Rostrum of Composers, the Mayor's Arts Award for Music in Vancouver, and the Juno Award for Classical Composition of the Year for My Name is Amanda Todd, which was commissioned and premiered by the National Arts Orchestra in 2018. She was also presented the Barbara Pentland Award of Excellence for Outstanding Contribution to Canadian Music by the Canadian Music Centre in BC. She was also the composer-in-residence for Music on Main and the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. Jocelyn taught music composition at the University of British Columbia School of Music for many years. She was a dedicated music educator who cared deeply for her students and the community. Jocelyn passed away on March 27, 2023. She's survived by her longtime partner and love, John Corsford, her family, and her many friends and colleagues. Today's episode of the Redshift Radio podcast is dedicated to the memory of Jocelyn Morlock. I speak with some of her closest friends and colleagues, including Mark Takeshi McGregor, Jordan Nobles, Rachel Awasa, and Jennifer Butler. We got together recently to talk about Jocelyn, to fondly remember our friend, our colleague, the importance of her work, and the importance of her legacy for future generations of composers and the Canadian new music community in general. I'm your host, Adrian Verdeo, for the Redshift Radio podcast from my home studio in Vancouver, BC, on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish peoples. Well, thank you everybody for coming over today uh, on a long weekend. Uh, I'm so glad that we can all get together in person and just chat and just remember our friend and talk about um, some fond memories and music and share times together. So um, firstly, I just want to thank everybody for coming and I really appreciate all of you. Also, as we were all very uh, closely involved in the recent concert memorial uh, evening for Jocelyn Morlock uh, just last month, and uh, as performers, as presenters, and as speakers, uh, but most importantly also as friends and colleagues, um, Mark and I played a duet, or trio, I'm sorry, um, a recently composed song by Jocelyn um, entitled Forgiveness. So Rachel performed a beautiful piano piece. Uh, Rachel, can you remind us the, the title of that piece? Uh, Phobos and Dimos circling. And this was a piece that you had commissioned from Jocelyn, or she'd written it with you, collaborated at some point? Yeah, it was uh, part of the commissioning project Cosmophony, um, which, and really, I mean, Mark deserves credit as his brainchild. Um, he, I was putting together, I was wanting to put together a, a show for new music in new places and wanted to do something in the, pla- wanted to do George Crumb in the planetarium. And Mark said, you should commission people to write pieces for each of the planets. I said, you should make it more complicated. And not knowing any better in those days, as it was my first commissioning project, <laughs> I said, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, in fact, it was a great idea. And it, you know, that, that project did very well for me. And, um, and as Jocelyn's piece, um, she wrote the piece for Mars. Phobos and Dimos are the two moons, the two irregularly shaped moons of Mars. Um, Mars being the god of war and Phobos and Dimos, meaning um, fear and dread. Those are the the um, those are the horses that pull the chariot of the god of war. Jen, you spoke uh, recently also at, at this evening for Jocelyn um, last month, um, obviously as a longtime friend and collaborator and uh, contemporary of hers uh, having come up. Can you tell us uh, the first time you met Jocelyn and uh, some of the early uh, encounters within the, the composition world? I have no idea when the first time I met Jocelyn was, but I do know that I moved to Vancouver in 1999 to do my master's degree at UBC and she was at UBC also. So it was, it must've been, excuse me, it must've been there. Um, she was in 
towards the end of her doctorate, I think around that time or, or well into it. Um, and I just know that I remember there were, there were no other women in the master's program and I had come from an undergrad program that had a lot of women in it. So it was a little shocking. And, um, so very quickly I looked to, to, uh, Jocelyn as a mentor and then within a, a few years, also a, a good friend. Jordan, uh, Redshift was one of the co-collaborative um, organizers for the evening as well. Obviously, you go back uh, quite a ways with, with Jocelyn, and uh, she was involved, uh, in, of course, in the early days of forming the Redshift Music Society. Um, wh- what was the first collaborative experience you had with Jocelyn? Do you remember that far back? Uh, <laughs> do you remember that far back? <laughs> um, the first time, um, the first collaborative experience was actually the first experience. I didn't know who she was, and I belonged... I was a member of the Ensemble Symposium um, Ensemble, and we were performing works of young composers in Vancouver. And Scott Wilson had asked her to write a piece for us. Uh, I don't remember the piece title, um, but we were rehearsing at UBC, and this composer came in, this Jocelyn Morlock with purple hair. She had her purple hair back then. And um, she was quirky and funny and excited to hear what we did, and it was I was just really taken with her. I'm like, who is this fun person, rather than like some old fart like me now? Um, <laughs> who who were the other people that that we had commissioned people composers that we'd heard of and we knew, but I had not heard of her, and and it was sort of a revelation, a surprise. I also was like, by far the one of the best pieces we we ever did. Yeah, I think there's kind of a, a sense we can get of the personality of the composer, uh, even just by hearing their music or no, being familiar with their body of work. Um, and I, I think that was the case for me, honestly, in that I had more of a professional relationship with Jocelyn and knew her pieces before I approached any of her guitar writing. The first encounters I had with her music was a piece that Mark and I played, um, was an arrangement of an earlier piece entitled Vertigris. Uh, we recorded it some years ago, um, and I was just very impressed with the color and all of the flavor in the work and kind of getting to know her personality more in the last few years gave me a better understanding, actually, of her music, some of the gestures, some of the humor, I think, also embedded in the music, um, and some of the references as well. Mark, obviously, you go back uh, quite a ways with Jocelyn, um, as, as close friends. Uh, at one point, you were roommates, I believe, also. Um, and of course, uh, collaborators in, on many musical events as well. Um, Queer Arts uh, Festival was also involved in presenting the the evening. Is that correct? Yeah. The um, the memorial concert for Jocelyn was uh, sort of a co presentation by a number of organizations. It was uh, Redshift, Queer Arts Festival, Music on Main, Hard Rubber Orchestra, CMC, uh, Canadian Music Center, BC Region. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, and um, as well as like music at Intima and Standing Wave, like the it was one of those instances where the whole community really came together, and it was very spontaneous. It was very instantaneous. It was it was really lovely to see how the community galvanized uh, for that. Um, it's funny because the Queer Arts Festival, uh, because I'm the art, present artistic director, um, was involved. Even though I mean. Jocelyn, of course, was a great ally, but didn't necessarily identify as queer, but you have some leeway as artistic director, I think. So, um, but yeah, we, we the, you and I, and Sarah Jo Kirsch, the soprano, we uh, played one of the more recent pieces of Jocelyn's. It was called Forgiveness, as you mentioned, uh, with text by Joy Kogawa. And um, it was actually written for my aunt's 80th birthday. Uh, which was postponed for several years, not the birthday itself, but the celebration for it uh, because of the pandemic. And we actually had just performed it a few months before uh, for uh, for my aunt, for, for her celebration. So it was very interesting to come back to that piece, um, sort of post-mortem, I guess, you know, because we had a certain attitude going into uh, that first performance and then to come back to it so soon after Jocelyn died, it really, um, it kind of changed the experience of that piece, I think, too, especially when you look at the text and things about how it's about, it's about family and it's about forgiveness and it's about, you know, the people who are closest to you and things. So, um, 
What I thought was interesting too was um, one of the comments I got back was how different that piece was stylistically compared to everything else in the program, um, which I didn't actually notice, but I had I actually heard from a few different people. Um, I just feel like I've been sort of like, I've listen, been listening to music for so long now. Um, like when we were roommates, uh, there'd be her music would be coming out of her room all the time. And, you know, or she'd be like, can you listen to this or things like this? And then even after that, uh, when, when we weren't roommates anymore, you know, she would always send me like MIDI files of what she's working on and says, what do you think of this? You know? And, um, and so I don't know, I sort of feel like because I've been sort of privy to that sort of evolution and I've really thought of it as being really different, but, um, looking back now, it is quite a bit different stylistically. I had heard that comment as well, actually, uh, kind of a bittersweet, uh, element of the comment is like, you know, it would have been nice to see this direction or this kind of, you know, pull yeah. this thread a little bit, right? Yeah, to see right. where this is going. Yeah. That's actually, yeah. Alfredo Santa yeah. Ana said that, um, he said he felt really, uh, gutted that, you know, there was like this new direction that her music was taking and we, we would never get to f find out what, it, you know, how it evolves. Yeah. So. That was, it was actually one of the last things that Jocelyn said to me. I saw her at the um, Little Chamber Music um, concert of um, Les Uedo. Uedo's yeah. songs um, just 10 days before she died. And, you know, I'd asked, I asked her how she was doing and she was saying, you know, that she'd been, um, she'd been struggling with composing, but that she felt like she had finally figured out how to compose again and mm. that she was and I you know I said I was really excited to hear where that was going to go um and then 10 days later she was gone yeah she talked a lot in the last year about returning to electronic music too and and experimenting with electroacoustic music um in a few interviews that I've listened to recently she mentioned that I'm wondering if anything exists, like I'm wondering if she actually started down that road. Yeah, and she she did a couple things, but I don't think she ever finished anything. Yeah, yeah. The next piece on the docket for her was actually a flute duo uh, with electronics for me and Paolo mm -hmm. Bord Luzzi, and um, uh, we uh, John Corswood and I were cleaning out her apartment the next day, and I found this notebook that she had that was dedicated to this piece and it was so fascinating to just sort of see the sketches and it didn't go that far into the book it was just a few pages mm -hmm. but just sort of going over like you know uh, mostly words and um yeah it was it was mostly it was mostly a collection of words and scribbles and things like that and so but yeah that was her that was uh going to be her um return to electronics uh, so there's something that she was quite interested in. Uh, yeah, we're, so, we're chatting. Uh, last time, I, the last time I did see her was at that really beautiful evening with your aunt, and we had the restaurant. And we had the the time to kind of sit and chat for a while, and she was talking about working in Ableton Live. And uh, I know also she had been studying flugelhorn uh, in the last couple of years, uh, playing duets with John, and, and really kind of finding a passion. She had done a uh, outdoor gig at the Mountain View Cemetery with Redshift also last summer, Jordan. Yeah, um, she yeah. played flugelhorn at that time. A uh, long composition of yours. I think it was a forty-five minute composition. Yes. You know, with performers, kind of a spatialized event. Um, yeah, and it was is really interesting to see. It's the sort of um, this rebirth or this kind of rediscovery or passion ignited. Um, and I can't help but think that all of those elements played into some of the new developing ideas she was starting to work through. You know, um, but coming back to the evening uh the memorial concert you know um uh, just just reflect on the crowd and and uh the reception afterwards as well you know there there was a real kind of beautiful gratifying feeling at least in that moment of seeing our community together um you know spending quality time together felt pretty special to me it was um a lot more a lot more heartbreaking than i had thought it would yeah, be yeah i agree um, seeing um, a lot of friends of hers that I hadn't seen um, in in a great deal of time, um, I'm and just and all the speakers, Jen especially. Yep. Um, I confess that I wasn't expecting to to feel as much because we were putting it on to get. It's like putting on a concert. You kind of are removed from enjoying the concert because you're so worried about all the details. But it was. Um, during it and afterwards, um, quite an emotional evening for me. 
some of the pieces actually I remember hearing them at uh, previous Redshift concerts as well Jordan um, and uh, I think there was a, an event actually at the Spinal Cord Center the Blisson uh, Spinal Cord Center where yes. some of the um, some of the works in the program were performed and uh, there was one where um, I thought it was a very poignant moment in the evening where yourself and a few other very close friends were walking around with the chimes and um, is a percussion work. Can you tell us about that piece, please? That piece is called Hatch, and uh, Redshift commissioned that from her for, I believe, the 10th anniversary of Redshift, so quite some time ago now, like 13 years ago. And um, uh, it was a sp- to be a spatial uh, percussion uh, piece, which we managed to do for spatially in the uh, in the Vancouver Playhouse. And the end of the piece, and we've done this piece maybe five or six times, um, just whatever we're like oh you know what we need uh, a, a good spatial percussion piece oh yeah jocelyn's got that one yeah um but the the poignant ending of that is where a bunch of people from the audience plants in the audience um with finger symbols uh start wandering around the space and playing uh at first uh loudly and then softer and softer and softer as they just meander through the audience, through the aisles and behind the audience. And it, it always uh, is very effective. That is one of my favorite pieces of hers. That was, that was the moment that I actually found probably the most emotional. It was right before I was about to speak and I was trying to squash all of my emotions down. <laughs> and um, I was listening to the music and, and trying to stay uh, a little bit distant. And then suddenly all my friends stood up and played these these little chimes and started wandering through and it it just really hit me and then uh, I had to go on stage and I was still I was still a little throaty after that but yeah. it, it it was a really beautiful moment to see just to see all these people who I knew were also really heartbroken wandering through um, through the audience and playing and yeah. contributing and making sound and and it took me back of course to the premiere of that piece at the Spinal Cord Center too. It's interesting because I like I was backstage because um, I was playing right after Jen talked, and I didn't actually realize that those were audience members. But for me, that was also that those chimes were like the most poignant moment. Like I just there was so much. Um, I don't know. There was there's like this sh- there was like this emotional shift that happened at that and I think I mean I could hear that it was spatialized but I just assumed that the percussionists because I wasn't looking on stage I was you know sitting trying to (laughs) trying to focus before I played but yeah there was a definite shift in the mood um, that happened so it's super interesting to discover that that was why yeah and that but that it that you know it affected me even though I had no idea that they were different people playing or that it was, you know, there's something about, and that, I mean, that speaks to, in some ways also to the genius of the piece is this sort of, you know, is this the connecting of the, um, that breaking of the fourth wall and the connecting of the community in with the, um, in with the performers on the stage and um, yeah audience part I mean it's not exactly an audience participation piece in a sense because they are plants but there's there's yeah there's something quite there was some there was just that was such a magical moment that yeah. night yeah I love the the idea of that like we can all make music you know there's something really um holistic about about that piece and it's funny because like I mean obviously you know Jordan uh like I'm familiar with that piece as well because yeah. uh you know it was commissioned when I was working with you at Redshift. Right. Um, but um, it never fails to surprise me, uh, and especially that particular night, because like I know that piece backwards and forwards. I know what's going to happen. And yet when everyone, like those, all your quote-unquote plants, everyone suddenly stood up and started playing these little finger symbols, I just lost it. Like it was just, because visually it was also so beautiful, you know, to sort of see, mm-hmm. um, to see the, to see the audience resonate, you know, as, uh, with with uh, you know with the energy in the air and things like that. Because I always liked that it, the the musicians or the musicians the the extra musicians come from the audience, yep. like not from backstage and suddenly they come onto onto into the uh, into view, but they come from amongst the audience themselves. And we do usually try and spread them out. Like, okay, you sit over there and you sit over there. Um, and I, I just like that that effect that suddenly there's more 
Yeah, the element of surprise. Yeah, yeah and, and this this opens up a bit more. Yeah. Like the whole experience of that piece. What's interesting to me is, I mean, I, I remember, a, you know, a couple of the um, more recent conversations that I had with Jocelyn on, sort of, you know, we went on a, on a few long walks where she was talking about um, wanting to break down some of the um, hierarchies that and some of the ways, some of the power relationships and power dynamics, some of the unhealthy power dynamics that exist in, you know, in classical music and in contemporary music. And it's interesting to think about this, that that, so that seed was already there, in a sense, in that piece. Mm -hmm. And, you know, come back to the programming, uh, there's such a variety of styles from different periods of time in Jocelyn's career, ending with perhaps her signature work, Exaudi, uh, performed by Music Intima, and Jonathan Lowe, cellist. You all have known, had known Jocelyn for so many years, and obviously had seen her progress as a composer, as an artist, um, and really establish herself. And uh, like I said, having just the last few years, getting to know her better, um, it did seem to me in the last 10 years, especially that her career really kind of you know, took a step off. She was the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra composer in residence. She'd won the Juno. She'd gotten some fairly significant international acclaim for composition. Um, as friends and colleagues and supporters, it must have been a, a moment of great pride for you all in seeing her succeed, but also uh, leading as a, as sort of an example and a model to younger composers as well. And we know that she touched so many people as an educator as well um, in our community. Uh, how do you see in general, the impact of Jocelyn's legacy going forward on not just Vancouver, but the Canadian music community in general. I'm quite fascinated about what what her career or what her um, what we're going to be playing of hers and talking about of hers in ten years and twenty years and and thirty years um, to see what I mean. Right now, it seems undeniable that her impact will live on for like generations. But um, you can't really predict the future. I would love to see what happens. I mean, I know that there's a lot of music that she's written and there's a couple pieces that have yet to be premiered, but um, it's finite. And we were talking about different directions, electroacoustic and flugelhorn. Um, so as well as what we're going to be playing in the future it would be it's quite um, um, it, it takes me back a bit to think about what we've lost like the next 30 years of things that she won't write or 40 years or whatever um, all that music that we won't hear but I think it's also interesting like you mentioned like you know the legacy of like Jocelyn being an educator and um, you know she taught a lot of students and she had an incredible influence over those students as well so it's really I'm actually kind of I'm encouraged uh, because I know that she had great faith in a lot of her students and her students loved her you know and I really do see a you know um, I kind of see that legacy going on through through them and it's a two-way street too. I think it's because um, we we had mentioned like Jocelyn had a recent interest in uh, in Ableton and electronics and things like that. But that was because she was working with composers at the time who were working in those you know that were working with electronics. Like she took as much inspiration from her students, I think, as she gave them. So it was really sort of yeah. It's it's nice to you know to be in touch with uh, some of her students lately and sort of seeing what they're doing and to see that sort of uh, lasting impact that yeah. Jocelyn's having on them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a really unique window into that this year because um, last summer Jocelyn decided to step away from teaching um, after 10 years of teaching at UBC. And uh, I was asked to, to take on a lot of her students. And um, so, I, yeah, I really got to see firsthand the impact of, of her work and uh, a lot of the pieces that I worked on with the students they had started with Jocelyn. And some of the things that I think it, se it sounds like she did is she opened sort of 
doors for students by allowing them to explore who they were in a really incredible way. I heard this again and again from students that that she was all about helping them find their voice, which, you know, is really in line with my philosophy as a teacher, too. Um, and I think I think you're right, Mark, that students, but also performers um, who love her music and have performed her music are going to be a huge part of her legacy. Um, people are just going to want to continue performing her music and hearing her music and remembering her lessons as they compose their music. Um, yeah, all the all of the students that I've worked with, um, you know, count her as one of one of their most important teachers. Yeah. And um, I think, yeah, it is a big part of her legacy. And and she did teach for a long time. And I know it was a hugely important part of her life. Mostly as a faculty member at UBC, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think that was where she began. Yeah. Well, I had a quite an interesting conversation with Glenn Sutherland um, shortly after Jocelyn's death, who um, I believe was Jocelyn's first composition student. That's um, he. He'd approached her after a concert about taking lessons, and she said, "Oh no, no, I don't teach." And some years later, I think he said three years later, she contacted him and said, "Are you still interested in composition lessons?" And he, he was delighted. This is how he remembers it. Um, and surprised that she remembered and that she'd contacted him. And so she started. he started going over to her apartment and taking composition lessons. And he said, um, in one of the moments that he recounted to me, which I love because it's just so Jocelyn, he, you know, there was a passage that he was working on. I mean, she was, she was he said she was very... Um, she wasn't directive in that she, you know, it always was about how his voice would unfold. So there was a section where, you know, he's like, I just, I, you know, this section isn't working for me. And so she's like, well, you know, why don't you try it up an octave? And they put it up an octave and they were both like, no, no, that's not it. And then she's like, well, why don't you put it down an octave? And he put it down an octave. He put, they put it down an octave to listen to the MIDI. And he was like, oh my God, that's it. That's it. How did you, how did you know? And he said, she just looked at him and said, oh, composition is so strange. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good voice. That's a very, very good impression. <laughs> I'm just excellent. like her. Yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah, absolutely. Which is funny because I'm actually imitating Glenn, imitating Jocelyn. <laughs> <laughs> well, to speak as a guitarist, you know, um, Mark's heard me talk a lot about oh you know writing for guitar and so tricky and this sort of thing and it is i think it's uh, probably everybody here is you know composer and player knows that um but i was just really blown away um with the small amount of pieces she had written for the guitar just how much of a knack she had for capturing really the natural voice of the instrument and still stretching you know um making challenging parts but very very practical in their um in their sense and really representing her voice very accurately as well so um, this generally feeling I get from talking with her colleagues, her students, um, and even her own mentors is that, you know, she just had this brilliant intuition uh, for styles, instruments, and indeed personalities of collaborators and performers. And I can't help but think regarding her legacy, you know, and her goals of trying to leave um, an impact on the community and change some aspects of the community of the past that were negative or um, in some ways, you know, maybe shutting the door. I, I think if anything, we can say that she, her legacy really was very inclusive uh, and really did um, consider per people's individual personalities, their individual needs, and, and really did have a feeling of opening the door to a lot of younger people who may not have experienced new music or perhaps, you know, her pieces or her personality brought them to concerts and sort of lit the fire for a lot of young people um, to you know, find a, a foot into the doorway of this uh, fairly small community, you know, but um, I think if anything else, we can, we can say that, you know, her, her mission was accomplished in that sense. I think it's also important to remember that she actually worked extremely hard to help young composers out. So it went beyond just the lessons and it went beyond just fostering um, their voices and their technique, but she actually worked really hard to find them opportunities to spread their names, people that she supported and believed in. She would, you know, uh, recommend them uh, for, and, and she would 
she would help them take those first steps in their career um, in a way that I think not in a really generous way. Like I think that generosity just infused her whole ethos as a as a, an, an educator, and and I think that has been really inspiring for a lot of other educators and for a lot of other people and her students. And I think that will be part of her legacy also. Well, I heard Marina Thibault and the the trio that Jocelyn wrote for her, Marina's trio is one of the you know one of her last works. Marina said when they approached Jocelyn about writing a piece, she said, "Yes, but if you want a piece from me, you also need to commission uh, this other you know a uh, young an emerging BIPOC composer." Mm. And, um, you know, and she suggested a composer and they, so their commissioning grant was to commission both of them. And apparently she, she mentored, it was a uh, Luis Ramirez and he, uh, she, she mentored him for free for several months. And he actually, there was a video of him speaking at the Allegra, um, tribute and he never met her in person, but they had this long, um, oh, that's interesting. They had this long Zoom relationship, and they collaborated on this piece. And he sp- he spoke very passionately about their connection that, that 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 they made through that project. Yeah, Marina talked also about the um, working because again, that piece was written started during the pandemic, and she said that it was Jocelyn was so much fun on Zoom. And she said, you know, fun and Zoom are usually not words you hear in the same (laughs) sentence, but that, you know, she would be getting them to try something and then, you know, they would they would play something and she would be so excited. She would be jumping around and like you couldn't, you know, so that you wouldn't, you know, you couldn't see her face in the screen anymore because she was just so, you know, she was so excited and so mobile. And um, she was flapping. Yeah, yeah. the flapping. I I think this is a really disarming and a kind of subtle thing that Jocelyn just naturally had, you know, her sense of humor, her sense of levity and sense of irony and, you know, her, her voices and her expressions, all these things that just kind of made you feel very comfortable entering into a professional environment as in a rehearsal or a concert situation, you know, that really go a long way. Um, and just kind of a, a natural thing that she just can help uh, projecting, right? Um, yeah, uh, Mark, can you speak a little bit to that, actually, as, as to her personality? I know that the two of you, obviously, you know, as roommates, you get to know each other pretty well, but I know you were really close buddies with Jocelyn in that, um, obviously, for many years, also before and after that as well, so. Um, yeah, um, I mean, there are lots of things to stick out. The flapping is definitely one of them. Um, actually, I remember we were rehearsing in this very room for that, for Forgiveness, the Joy Kogawa song. Yeah. And Sarah Jo Kirsch was the soprano, and uh, Sarah had never met Jocelyn before, and so they were quite nervous. Um, and um, and it's you know, of course, you can't do anything if someone's nervous. I'm like, you know, ah, don't worry about it. She's just gonna be, you know, blah blah blah, this sort of thing, right? But of course, so Jocelyn shows up and and, and listens to the song, and at the end of the of the run through, Jocelyn flaps, you know, uh, she takes her arms and sort of waves them around excitedly, and I just thought there was such a like it's true. It's sort of, there's something disarming about it because you, I think if you're meeting Jocelyn for the very first time, you have this idea of what, you know, what she's like as a quote unquote composer, you know. But she's actually just, you know, a, just a very. She could be very joyous, you know. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I would say too that, you know. I mean, she was somebody. Obviously, we lived together, and, um, and even after she moved out, she literally moved like down the street from me. So when the pandemic, when the, when everything went shut down in the pandemic, everyone was like, form your bubbles, this sort of thing. It was just sort of like this no-brainer. It's like, oh, well, we're going to be in each other's bubbles, you know? And so I'd go over there every Monday night and we'd have dinner and things like this. And um, the thing I sort of, I, I, that got me was like, um, we text all the time, right? And so it was just the, the thing that in the days after she died was just sort of like, like I had this like trigger finger, like I just wanted to like text her all the time, you know? And um, and even now, it's not so much that anymore. But the thing that I have um, that uh, that is always going through my head is like, um, oh God, she would find that really funny, you know, or or oh she would hate that, <laughs> you know, like um, there there's little things like that that sort of are, are always popping into my head, and it's just sort of those um, little shadows of her, I guess, that sort of. Uh, that, that I keep with me. At the memorial, Carol Todd spoke um, and it references this, this major work of hers um, on the theme of Amanda Todd, where she referenced bullying and other, you know, really 
poignant and um, you know very topical societal issues and that I think uh, really important issues as well uh, laced into sort of the fabric of her works into the text as well. Was that a direction that Jocelyn was always interested in kind of um, dealing with social issues and social justice perhaps or uh, more specific events based on on real life situations um, or was this a theme that developed later in her output? Um, Jordan maybe you can speak to that a bit. I think it developed later. Um, it didn't seem when we were younger to be uh, at the forefront, but it became more and more important as, uh, and clearly um, influenced her work uh, in, in, later, in later years, the last, say, decade or so. Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about your experience working on Phobos and Deimos uh, circling with Jocelyn? Uh, this piece is from 2008, um, we were discussing in the break, uh, just sort of maybe some of the differences in working with Jocelyn versus other composers and kind of feeling the sense of, you know, comfort uh, discussing the, the piece with her and, you know, revisions and that. Well, Jocelyn was the first composer where I ever felt safe to ask for revisions. Mind you, that was also, I didn't really have a choice in that um, I, she loves repeated notes on the piano. And I just, the she had this repeated, so the Phobos and Deimos has these wicked, just like tremolos in one, the right hand in the piano, while the left hand is going crazy and all of these sort of polyrhythmically against it. And, you know, I just, I couldn't do it. And it was, you know, and I was, you know, to be fair, I was premiering eight other works on the same concert. And I was just finally, I was just like, okay, I'm just, I'm just gonna have to ask because I just, I just can't do this. And she was so totally gracious about it. And so she rewrote some of them for me as trills, and it became something that was really doable for me. And she was so lovely about it that I was like, oh, oh, maybe I can actually, maybe it's not such a totally shameful thing to admit that this particular thing doesn't work for my particular body. Yeah. Um, so I'm much more demanding as a performer now than I used to be, <laughs> so we can thank Jocelyn for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also, for the memorial concert, I was like, okay, I'm going to do the repeated notes. So I didn't even have the score for that one anymore. I had to like, you know, I... I emailed Cheryl Duvall, who's like, oh, you know, I don't have it scanned in, and then, but I got it from Greg Newsom, and so I, you know, and then I got, you know, and then I emailed Greg Newsom, who sent me the copy of the score, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do them. I still can't play them. <laughs> and then I was just like, okay, no, that's just, this is, but, and then I was like, well, yeah, but this is also, this is the version that Jocelyn wrote for me. Yeah. And I don't have to feel ashamed about her writing, you know, doing it the specific way for me. It yeah. was really... You know, it's, I mean, it's meant that um, my process with composers tends to be much more, I mean, not so much sort of like, I mean, I say much more demanding, but I don't think that's really it. A lot of the time, there's just, there's just a lot more conversation that goes on. Like, there's a lot of just like going for tea and yeah. having long talks that seems to be much more of the, pro compo you know, much more of the process now of commissioning works than it used to be. Um which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of lovely, actually. Yeah. So that it becomes, the commission becomes more of a two-way conversation. Yeah. Mm, and that's something that I think as classically trained musicians, we, we're not often taught to do, to have that dialogue with composers who are, like, we're, you know, living composers that we're working with. I mean, I think part of it is, like, you know, um, our training is such that it's like, you have to play this exactly as a composer wrote it or you're not good, you know? And I mean, to a certain extent, that's actually, it's valuable training because it actually really pushes us in terms of like what, you know, who we are as musicians and our, and, and our technique. But I think one of the most valuable things is be, being able to actually sit down with a composer and sort of say, you know, um, for me, because like we're at points in our careers now where I know what works well for me and I know what doesn't work well for me. And um, yeah, I'm, like you, I'm, I'm in a comfortable enough position now where I can sort of say, you know, let's explore, let's explore these other options. And you're right, actually, like having that association with Jocelyn was one of those things that helped uh, create that comfort of uh, having like real dialogue with, with, with composers, as opposed to just sort of, you know, quote unquote, doing as I'm told and then going home and crying afterwards. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that it, that it can be associated with a... Um a spirit of working together to make something beautiful instead of just approaching it with shame. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, what is this still classical music? If there's no shame, <laughs> I think that. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for all composers, but I th- I think composers welcome that dialogue so much. Oh, yes, I mean we are often just like in our little rooms all by ourselves stabbing in the dark at what we think might work and when we get that kind of feedback from performers it's so valuable so yeah um i think i think that uh, it's wonderful to hear that work you know working with jocelyn taught you that and and i hope that i hope that others listen and, and like you know those dialogues get created because it's so important for for everyone Jocelyn was also a big part of my finishing my dissertation. Um, I had two composers actually give me really um, useful advice. One of them was Rodney, who told me to drink, and it worked. I mean, I'm not, in, and, and thankfully, you know, I was like, Rodney, if I'm an alcoholic by the end of my dissertation, it's your fault, and I'm not, so this is all good. <laughs> um, or I'm just in denial, we'll see. Um, Jocelyn, on the other hand, I remember being up at the library and, you know, taking out more, dissert, you know, more books because I was at the don't want to write, read another book stage of my dissertation. And she asked me how it was going. And, you know, I said, well, you know, here I am checking out more books instead of writing. And she said, well, there will come a point when it gets to be harder not to finish than it does to finish. And that's when you'll start writing. And I said, oh, I can't imagine that. But a couple months later, then I was just like, oh, this is getting really hard not to have this done. I'm like, oh, Jocelyn was so right. Mm -hmm. That's so funny. Because you told me that. And I thought it was advice coming directly from you. And I I, I said the same thing to you. There's you. There's like, there's no way that day will come where it actually requires more energy to avoid the thesis because I can avoid it forever. And I literally woke up one morning and I was like, oh my God, I hate myself. I have to finish this thesis. And, but then, yeah, you told me later that was actually it was wisdom from Jocelyn. And I've told that to so many people finishing their theses. And I like, literally, it's like some of those valuable advice that, uh, that, that you can give somebody, I think, in that position. You find the voices in your head just get louder and louder with each day. And you just kind of you need to just kind of shed this cross to bear after a while and can't can't move on um or it's just sort of like a it was a visceral physical reaction yeah, for me like i actually like leapt out of bed practically like it's, that's very much like her experience composing mine too whereas it's, it's like you're trying and it's hard and it's easier to go for a walk or it's easier to do something else but eventually the pain of not composing the piece is stronger than the pain of composing the piece Um, because you have to do that. You have to make this thing and you get pulled back into it by, by the, by that being, by, by being away from it too long. Mm. I think being a composer is actually excellent preparation for writing a a doctoral thesis. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the process is quite, quite similar and painful in the same way. Yeah. She was a nocturnal composer, Um, so she would compose like into the wee hours of the night, and um, she had an electronic keyboard that she would compose on, and she had headphones on, and um, so, you know, obviously she could compose at any hour of the day, and um, it was really funny, though, because like when we lived together, uh, the wall, we shared a wall, our our bedrooms shared a wall, and um, the electronic keyboard was up against that wall, and so like at two or three o'clock in the morning, I would wake up. And I could, you couldn't hear the noise, the, the music itself, but you could hear the actual pressure of the keys as she was, as she was playing. So you hear, like, and it was just, it was one of those things where you think it would be irritating, but it was actually sort of reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those sort of like white noise sort of things that was just happening every single night and you just mm. didn't question it. She worked um, hard, didn't she? Oh my gosh, she was like, she was the workaholic, I think. Look how much she produced. I mean, yeah. she has a huge catalog of works. Yeah. And it didn't come easy. Yeah. Well, it never comes easy. Oh, I'm sure there's people out there. No. No? Nope. Let's name them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. No one, Let's name these second-rate composers. I, I think it was it, Keith Hamill said in, uh, we had a, a, there was a really beautiful like sort of tribute um, 
afternoon uh, to, to Jocelyn, and I think it was Keith who said, like, no one gets that good by, without working really hard. Yeah. And, and I think that's, yeah. And yet, Mark, you had actually mentioned to me at one point in the past that a lot of her compositions were based on improvisations. Um, was this something that also that you witnessed uh, living with her that, you know, you would maybe see like the budding ideas that later became pieces, for example, uh, based on spontaneous improvisations? Yeah, she recorded her improvisations. Um, and I wasn't privy to most of them because she was doing it on that electronic keyboard that was like, up against my wall. So like my, you know, I was only privy to thaka, 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 thaka. <laughs> of course. But, um, you know, like she would start off almost everything from an improvisatory style. And that really, I mean, if you if you know her music, obviously it has like this very sort of, you know, um, it, it has a very improvisatory nature to it, you know, and um, um, it's because that's the the beginnings of, of, of what of, of what she would do. So kind of a stream of consciousness at times, like the kind of like following this thread, you know, there's motives, but also this kind of free flowing musical ideas that, that weave themselves through her, her compositions. Totally. Yeah. Rhythmically, uh, a lot of rhythmic variety too. Not a, not a stream of eighth notes, but yeah. like, yeah. she loved flurries. quintuplets. Groupings. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. That was one of the things that really struck me coming back to Phobos and Daimos. Cause that was, I mean, I still remember when Mark, you know, when I heard that Jocelyn had died, Mark phoned and I was on a run and Mark called and I, you know, Shara and I were putting together a, a show and I was like, oh, it's going to be some sort of thing about the show. And I'm just, I was like, I'm going to run. I'm going to avoid this. Um, That's so funny because when I called you and, and it went to, when it went to a voicemail, I was like, you're avoiding me. <laughs> <laughs> it was true. But then I called and yeah, I called you back, and so I, we were out on. We were actually, we were out getting the book for the show. Um, the first thing I did when I came home was to pull out Phobos and Deimos um, and play it. And um, I mean, I, I brought up the story because one of the things that struck me when I came back to it again was just how much the. Um, Just the flexibility of the rhythms and how many things that I'd been just been I'd been counting as four plus four were actually three plus five, um, and wanting to really you know I brought them out much more when I played it again this year. Um, it also struck me as I was playing it. I thought, how did I not see how dark this piece is? But I think it's because maybe it was in the context of. You know this piece, this commissioning yeah, project about set the, of pieces. yeah the commissioning yeah. project about the planets and so I was thinking about it when I premiered it and I mean on I think really all the other times since because I've played it a number of times since since that premiere for Redshift at the Planetarium um, I think I was thinking of it as this sort of mythological abstract far away kind of thing and playing it again after she died. It just it struck me how you know fear and dread as a very much much as much more personal kind of yeah. you know and that that passage where there's there's a passage in it um, for I don't know like tw twelve bars no more than that like twenty four bars where she just you're just repeating the same um, six notes on the you know on the lowest part of the piano and. Um, the energy that comes out of the piano, like it, 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 playing it again in 2023, it felt like connecting to the center of the earth, that there's just this, like this energy coming out of the soil and out, you know, through the soil and out of the piano. Yeah. It's, it's a savage moment. Right? It's mm -hmm. such a powerful, powerful work. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, it, people talk a lot about Jocelyn's quirkiness and her humor, but there was a real profundity. Um, and, I mean, I, th I think a few people commented on that after the Allegra, um, after the Allegra tribute on um, Thursday of this week, which was also that they, you know, that it was...
that particular concert chose a lot of the darker works. Um, and it was interesting to hear all of those together. I mean, admittedly, so I, so I played um, the Jack Pine, which I don't actually think is one of the darker works. I opened with that. Um, and then the Tom Cohn songs, the two Tom Cohn songs, the second of which was the last thing that Tom Cohn ever wrote. Jocelyn talks in a really beautiful, talked in a really beautiful way about that to the Georgia Strait about writing, uh, writing the song after he had died and have, you know, coming back to that and playing her music shortly after her death. That was, it was quite a remarkable parable, parallel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I completely lost it playing in the orchestra for Amanda Todd. I was so happy to be tucked in the back, kind of halfway behind the curtain and be doubling the trombones because I just started to weep. And um, I was like, I, yeah, I, I mean, all those, there's the piano has a lot of repeated Fs. I got all of those. But um, yeah, I just, I completely lost my place. And I was like, well, at least the trombones have it. <laughs> It's not very often the trombones have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but the brass section sounded fantastic in that orchestra. That piece, the Amanda Todd, has this moment where everything really transforms. You know, it, it, it goes very dark, and then it transforms into something else. And it, I mean, it's very, very obvious in that piece. And Jocelyn talks about that, um, and and that moment of of uh, the dark story that it's about and then transforming into a hopeful message. But it it's made me listen to some of her other works in a similar way. Like I find that this is a real, like Jocelyn rarely ends a piece leaving us feeling hopeless and dark. And so much of her music goes to a place of darkness, but transforms. And so much of her music ends in that place of either calm and peacefulness or hope. Um, and I think uh, I'm starting to hear her music more and more that way, that that the, the transformation that happens is actually part of the power. And I think we hear that in, in a lot of her, a lot of the works that have been performed the most, like Exaudi and, um, and Amanda Todd, of course, but even in her smaller works, there is that feeling. And um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed yeah, that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard her talk about that at a, at a, at a talk at UBC mm. um, before I think she, before she was teaching there, um, talking about Exaudi and uh, and the the beautiful ending, the beautiful um, peaceful ending of Exaudi, but there's the dramatic dissonant thing earlier, and she was talking about how you could just do the peaceful bit, but you have to come through the storm mm-hmm. for the you know the clearing to be to be more poignant. To be better, I based an entire piece on that statement from her. <laughs> I was like, "That's really, it's a good formula." <laughs> really good form. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and that's what. Yeah, she. That is a thing that she actually purposely puts in. I don't think Phobos and Daimos does that. It's no, it's because it's, it's angry and it stays angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You mentioned it, Jordan. Um, you know, obviously, as composers, Jen and Jordan, um, and friends, but contemporaries. You probably had a sort of a, a special bond. Uh, we talked about trying to complete deadlines and all the practical things that come up as composers, you know, uh, working with performers and things like that, uh, demands, um, you know, and a lot of the stress that's built in that a lot of people probably are just not aware of what happens behind the scenes. You know, they, they see the end result, they see the recording, they see the concert, um, and they don't see all the months and months of kind of back and forth and deciding. Uh, but I would imagine that the three of you, and, and one thing that I was struck with when I moved to Vancouver was that there was this really close-knit community with the composers, with the performers, but especially, you know, under the umbrella of Redshift and the various collectives here, uh, you all had a very special bond, yet there was a very distinctive style and kind of approach that you all had as well, um, which is really beautiful to see because I know composers can get a little territorial and maybe mm-hmm. a bit defensive in other ways also, you know, uh, performers are also like that, right? But um, <laughs> Mark is kind of puzzled right now. Out of nowhere, what? <laughs> <laughs> Flutists aren't competitive. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've been quite um, fortunate in that she, and, and maybe... Maybe I'm not the only one because Mark has spoken of this too, where she texts 
a lot when she's composing a piece and sends the little MIDI files and complains about not being able to compose today and I don't know how to compose and blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, yeah. And and then she'll say, well, this is what I'm working on and she'll send a little MIDI file and I'm having the same struggles, right? Like, how the hell do I compose again? I did it yesterday, but what the hell? And she sends these little MIDI files and she's like despondent and she can't write and she sends this little thing which is brilliant <laughs> i was like quit like I, it came to the point where i'm like i'm not listening to that today until i'm finished trying to compose because it'll just be like what the hell like she's upset and this thing is great but it's it was neat to see the little midi files take shape like i've seen i've like she's got a number of like i'm thinking of some of the concertos uh, concerto that she she wrote that started out as these little struggles and this little little tiny thing that she sends me and then later I hear the recording on an album and it's like I remember that mm -hmm. I remember that moment but she's constant struggling yeah with with how to with how to work today and it's just so, so fascinating because the music sounds often just sounds so spontaneous yeah. and effortless yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, she revised a lot too like there's yeah, many, many versions of many, many pieces, I remember. For me, because, um, well, both Jordan and Jocelyn were almost the same age, um, almost days, born days apart, actually. Um, they reminded each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they were, they were for me, uh, especially when I first arrived in Vancouver, and, and because I'm several years younger, uh, mentors. And, and hearing both of them talk about this feeling of like, I mean, Jordan on many occasions texts me and says, I have forgotten everything I ever knew. Like, I don't know how to compose. And oh, um, God, you do that too. That's true. And, and you know, every time I start a new piece, that's exactly how I feel. Like, I'm, how do I do this? I, I've forgotten everything. I've never done this before. Every project feels brand new and you have to like relearn. But ha having that modeled to me through Jocelyn and Jordan, who were both composers that I looked up to so much and taught me so much, normalize that feeling for me and really helped me get through it and it's something that I pass on to all my students all mm -hmm. the time I say you know and I don't always drop names but sometimes I do I say you know really accomplished composers feel this way too and that's that's really helped and um, I know that something that gets talked about a lot with Jocelyn is that she suffered really deeply from imposter syndrome and I think all well I think all students and all creative people probably suffer from that at some point in some way um i remember i was spending some time with uh, with some of of the graduate students that had worked with her after she died and we were talking about this and how she really validated their experiences with imposter syndrome and we kind of talked about how you know what if jocelyn felt that way and yet we all know how great she was then maybe like when we feel that way we can we can say start saying to ourselves like hey maybe we don't really suck like maybe actually mm -hmm. like just that seeing seeing that someone like jocelyn could feel that way and then obviously we all know it's not true because she's amazing yeah. then maybe when we feel that way it's not true also and that's something that we can take away from from le and learn from her experience it's one of the things that i loved so much about jocelyn is that it never felt like there was a facade you know, she, it seemed like yeah. when she was struggling with things, she would tell you. When, you know, she didn't have this kind of false front poker face going on mm. that so many of us develop. There was just, it just, you know, she was... And when you talked to her, she just felt so authentic. It's so important for especially... Uh, younger composers to see that and to have that modeled for them i think it's i think it's made a huge impact well probably for all of us right? i would think so i mean yeah. I, I think a lot of composers specifically live a even more isolated existence than for the performers you know we have doing gigs oh, yeah. socialized you know going yeah. up you describing jocelyn in the late hours in, of her room you know working on things and isolation that's sort of the requirement of the job right and you have to be able to tune other things out of your life and make sacrifices for that time which puts an even greater value on it for yourself to accomplish you know to feel like you're doing justice to the piece and the performers and yourself but uh you know you're, you're right jen i think it's probably a lot of very important conversations um 
and also, you know, just that sort of guidance that she provided to younger people to let us all know, like, I mean, it's okay. We, we all have fragilities and insecurities. And like you said, the imposter syndrome is just something that everybody deals with in different ways. Um, so I totally agree. I think there is that kind of genuine spirit that always lived through her. I will say too, though, um, there were times when she would say, okay, this is a good piece. And you knew that, you know, she had arrived, you know, <laughs> she goes, it's good now. <laughs> yeah. Every, every piece had that ended with that, right? Mm, no, she'd be, she'd be struggle, struggle, no. struggle, struggle. And then she'd be like, I oh, got yeah. it. I got okay, it. She, she'd be like, okay, this doesn't suck anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a couple of times when she'd be like, actually, no, this is a good piece. Right. It was cool at the memorial also um, to uh, hear the words of uh, Nikki Lise, who was a very close uh, friend and colleague of Jocelyn's back in, um, was it University of Brandon, actually, that they were both, or University yeah. of Manitoba? Uh, Brandon. It was Brandon, actually, yeah. Uh, and uh, kind of talking about some of the, the fun they had uh, back in Manitoba. And certainly also she left a, a massive legacy and impact uh, on Manitoba and the musicians there as well. Uh, Jordan, you traveled for her funeral, is that correct? To, yes, uh, uh, to Winnipeg. To Winnipeg, was it? Yeah. yeah. Can you speak a little bit to um, the feeling uh, in the community, perhaps, of Jocelyn's impact and uh, also kind of um, revisiting her, you know, her hometown? It was, a, it, was, it was actually quite interesting for me to go there and to be in a crowded church of people I didn't know who were mourning her. And I mean, her family was obviously there, but there were so many other people there that I, I'm like, who, who, who are you? Like, it was like, here's another community. Here's another group of people that, that loved her. And, um, it was, it was heartwarming to see that. Right. And to, uh, meet her mother and her brother who I guess you've, you've met them before, but I, yeah. but I, I hadn't before. And to, uh, yeah, I was pretty cool and calm uh, for the most part. I mean, it was a, it's a memorial. It was only about an hour or so, and there was a bunch of music and a couple of speakers. But when I met her mother afterwards, I just, I just lost it. I don't know because her mother and her father kind of, her, her mother and her brother kind of, you can see across the room. That's her brother. Yeah, that's that's her family. Right, you, they just had a certain way about them that seemed so familiar, and I just lost it when I met them. But it was interesting to see a whole other community, a whole other group of people yeah. that knew her. I had a strange moment from that because the person who conducted that her memorial in Winnipeg was a mentee of my parents from when they had lived in Winnipeg. Huh. This is someone who you know we had like Christmas ornaments from Karen Toole. And, you know, my mom stayed in contact with her and told her whole life. And so she and I had emailed back and forth a few times. So, yeah, after Jocelyn's death, I got this email from Karen saying, um, you know, Brenda sent me all these recordings to listen to as I get ready. And I see your name here. Does this mean you knew Jocelyn? Hmm. Oh. Small world. Yeah, really. And I think even our community, even smaller in that... Um we can really start to see, you know, unfortunately, the impact people had uh, after they're gone, you know, and sort of the, the waves of uh, inspiration and, and influence, even in music, not having met the people, you still realize that there's, there's a massive impact that they had on the listeners. Um, I know we discussed a little bit uh, the recent CBC uh, tribute as well, and they did a four-hour tribute memorial program for Jocelyn, highlighting some key works and... Uh, talking with um, a, a couple of you all as well. Jen, you spoke on the program. Can you tell us a little bit about that program, um, some of the other speakers as well, please? I'm still working my thro way through it. Um, you know, it's it's emotional um, visiting all of these things and the works and the tribute concerts. And I've been asked to write a few uh, pieces about Jocelyn as well. And so, you know, I, I definitely, yeah, I've been working my way through it. And, and Rodney Sherman gave me some good advice to, to do it while I'm doing the dishes. So that's what he said he was doing. And I thought that's a great idea and do it in small installments. So I haven't listened to the whole, the whole program yet, but I have listened to, um, well, I'm well over the halfway mark anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it's it's very thoughtfully put together. A lot of uh, the speakers who spoke at the memorial were asked, including me, to record some of some of the thoughts that we shared at the memorial. So it brings back some of those words for people who couldn't be there. Um, so far, I've also heard really wonderful interviews with uh, John Corsrude, her partner, um, who hasn't done a lot of public speaking about about her yet. Of course, that must be terribly hard. So to hear him talk about those intimate things with her. Um, what I rem- really, re- what re- resonated with me, what John said was that being around Jocelyn, you forgot that she was this famous composer because she was so unpretentious and didn't, I mean, she talked about her work, but only in how stressed it made her, but she didn't, <laughs> she didn't talk about her work or like, oh, this, this commission has come through and this, like never. Mm-hmm. And so when you spent time with her, you talked about other things and you would sometimes forget. Um, and actually, since she died, it's it's almost been um, surprising to me. Like I'm, I just like I I actually didn't even realize how far and wide her music had traveled. It, you know, it, it it it's actually since she died that I've learned more about her career because I I you know um, that wasn't part of your the experience you had with her in person. And so John talked about that a lot. That yeah. that their relationship really that wasn't a major part. Um, a beautiful interview with Denise Ball as well, and she spoke. Um, with such, such great insight about Jocelyn's music and how it makes you feel and it makes you feel in the w- same thing that we've talked about here um, with, there's just so much integrity to the emotions that Jocelyn brings to the music. And that is something really special. Um, and I don't know what is in the second half yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it next time I do dishes. I'll, <laughs> I'll check into it. <laughs> I had that same experience um, after her death, um, preparing for the memorial, but also going through her bio and and other things to find out that she was more successful and more important in Canada than she let on. Than she, um, like she didn't brag about this and this and this big commission and this big thing. Um, you saw a number of the more public things, the Juno and whatnot, but there was, she's, I mean, an important figure in Canadian music. I mean, the four hour special on Canada's national broadcasting. A full page in the Global Mail. Full page in the Global yeah. Mail. I mean, that's a, that's an acknowledgement of how yeah. important um, mm-hmm. she was. I had an interesting um, conversation with someone who I had no idea knew Jocelyn, someone who I've met so through like some you know, somebody who I know from parties, right? Who's um he's a bartender. And he knew Jocelyn from a pandemic book club. They would get together and meet in a park. And he said, you know, he'd only known her a couple of years, but he said, you know, they would they would all get together and, and, and talk about this book. And he said, you know, Jocelyn would often be quite quiet but then she would say something and there would be this pause and then you could see around the circle as people started to like got the joke and that would laugh you know and would laugh but you know she was like she was so smart and so funny and to the like it was so it was it's so interesting to get this picture of her of someone who didn't know her as a composer at all yeah like just knew, you know just knew her as this like interesting person in his book club and he hadn't actually heard any of the music until after she died and then he was like oh my god <laughs> yeah it's amazing wow yeah and it speaks to just how um i'm gonna say complex her personality was and how many different sides um you know among the many musical gifts that she left and her legacy she left uh mark you also mentioned that she left a stash of yarn in her uh, apartment is that correct uh, can you discuss uh she was an avid knitter is that correct um, avid knitter is a very, very polite way of describing it. So John actually just texted me the other day. He discovered yet another couple boxes of yarn. Wow. Um, so yeah, um, she she knitted a lot. Uh, she knit. She had an online knitting club during the pandemic, um, to which I was not privy. But um, and um, yeah. She was, uh, she knitted me, oh, slippers. Uh, So um, my grandmother used to knit me like uh, slippers uh, that I was sort of wearing. And I'd wear them out because I I scuffed my feet on the floor. So they always wear out. And so she made me a special pair of slippers that were like extra fortified on the bottom. They had like this sort of like 
suede leather thing and it took years for me to actually wear them through but i finally did wear them out and so um she had there's like actually one of the last things uh she had made uh were well three quarters of my slippers which paul hung has actually finished now oh. <laughs> so, um so i have to go pick them up from him her but freezer was full of yarn there was yarn everywhere oh. <laughs> there was yarn everywhere yarn and nail polish like if she had two guilty pleasures, it was yarn and it was nail polish. And I know you still have nail polish, the, the remnants of nail polish from the memorial concert on your fingers, Jordan. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'd seen some, uh, maybe some press photos or, or one that she had used uh, with a really colorful toque and maybe there were some mittens or something like that as well. So yeah, there's a, this hobby she had embraced some time ago. She, she knitted also, we had matching scarves. Um, hers was purple, mine was red. And they had balls hanging from them and they were just they were just obscene enough <laughs> um we i don't know if you're gonna use this or not they look like teats and um if you wore them a certain way you could actually drape them so that you had like these rows of teats going down your uh, going down the front of you mm -hmm. um and uh yeah that was that cracked me up i laughed I laughed my ass off when she gave me that. Well, uh, on the topic, Mark, I know some years ago um, you put an album, Sins and Fantasies, um, representing the seven deadly sins. And Jocelyn was one of the contributing composers. Um, was it Lust, actually, that she was the sin? Yeah. Um, so like like Rachel did with Cosmophony, I had a, a similar project because um, like Cosmophony was so successful and so great. I thought, well, I'm going to do a flute version of that. And um, it was based on the seven deadly sins. And I asked a bunch of composers to each write a piece that was inspired by one of the sins. And so Jocelyn, because we're roommates at the time, uh, had first pick, and so she chose Lust. And um, I think w the expectation was that it was going to be very sensuous. It was going to be very, um, you know, that, that sort of like that that is like full of lyricism and that sort of thing that we that, that we associate with Jocelyn's writing and she went in a totally different direction and it really reflects that sense of humor uh, that she has um, it was I had to quote Marilyn Monroe I had to lick the alto flute at one point as if uh, performing fellatio um, who else did I have to quote there's all these bizarre quotes all the way through it and it really was just sort of like a wink wink nudge nudge uh, kind of piece that is um, happy birthday Mr. President that's it the piece ends the <laughs> yes. piece ends with me saying happy birthday Mr. President and uh, beautiful yeah, yeah it was it was such a it was such a funny piece and it was so unexpected of her I think she realized that a lot of people were going to be take like a lot of her fellow composers were taking that the project very seriously and they're like you know um, they're looking into their respective sins like you know, they're really delving in and sort of like doing a lot of soul searching and things like this <laughs> And she was like, nope, I'm just going to keep this really light and, 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 and silly. And mm -hmm. it, was, it became a great, uh, it was a great moment of levity in the, in, yeah. in the series. Was that the, the lone solo flute commission from Jocelyn? Or did you have some other um, solo flute projects with her? Mm. Oh, gosh, I'm going to be on the spot now because I think that's the only one. Yeah. Um, but there's other people, like, so she wrote, a uh, flute and piano piece for Rachel and, uh, and me uh, called uh, I Converse With You in a Dream. And that's probably, it's probably the com the one, com it's probably the commission that's been played the most uh, of, of, of what we've commissioned as a, as a duo. Although we were saying earlier that the piece uh, that, that Jennifer Butler wrote for us is also, is all, is, is played quite a, yeah. quite a lot as well. Um, and uh, a piece for eight flutes called Salamander and the song, of course, yeah. uh, the Joy Kogawa song. Yeah. And I feel like there's other things. But it's flute and guitar. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, that was a, an arrangement, I think, was it previously harp and flute? And that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that was originally for, for the second movement of a flute and harp piece. Is yeah. there a piece called Lipstick for solo flute? Not by her, as far as I know. But there's Fallure. Who did she write that for? Oh, that's the first piece. That was actually, um, that was the first piece that she wrote for, it was a co-commission uh, between me and Shinoa Anderson. Ah. Hmm. And I just got back from my master's and I 
approached her. I went to UBC. I, I, I sort of, I think I just found her like roaming the hallways, and I said, "Will you write me a solo flute, please?" <laughs> and she said, "Well, Shinoe also just just asked me, so can I write it for both of you?" And yeah, that velour was a solo alto flute piece that mm. was a set mm. of variations followed by the theme at the at the very end. And uh, yeah, that's one of her earliest mm. uh, pieces in her catalog, I think. Bob Pritchard at the um, afternoon at UBC um, after Jocelyn died was saying that um, he loved jo- that he and Jocelyn would have these words that they would see each other and just say the word that was kind of one of the part of the and that you know and so he cl- he closed by saying Felur. <laughs> <laughs> you also do a good Bob Pritchard impression. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Uh, I think this is really important for me to see all of you and just kind of share our thoughts and memories. But mostly, I just want to really express my gratitude for all of you. Um, You've been close friends and colleagues over the years. And uh, it's just a reminder in difficult times like this, um, you know, the things that are important and, you know, the memories that we share together and the music of our friend that will live forever. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.